name is Sean Griffin. And pronounce your last name for me. Levins. Levins. It's just like Evans with an L in front okay. of it. Okay. I'm interviewing Jane Levins for Georgia State University's Women's March Oral History Project. The date is February 4, 2018. And the interview is taking place in Clayton in Raven County, Georgia. So um, during the interview, if at any time you want to stop, take a rest, or you don't want to answer a question, this is your interview, you, you manage it. I got it. Like you want it. Okay. This is Jane Levins to fill in for the audio recorder. It wasn't on at first. So Jane, what year were you born and where? Tell me about your beginnings. I was born in Rotan, Texas, a little town in central west Texas. In 1931. And was that out in the country? <clears throat> no. Uh, we lived in a small town. Uh, my father owned a lumber yard. My mother taught school. Uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. My grandmother lived with us for a number of years. She was born actually during the Civil War. And I had some marvelous stories from her from, that she had gotten from her mother about the Civil War. Uh, I had other relatives living there. It was a kind of town where if you got a tree, you planted it, we're pretty out far west. If you went out one direction from our town, you were in lovely cotton country, good soil for farmers. If you went out the other direction, you got into ranch land, a lot of ranches out that way. Uh, in the latter life, my mom and dad uh, owned a were regular were uh, consummates for mobile oil there in town and uh, did a lot of business with farmers and ranchers in, in the area. I had a very happy childhood there. I, I, it was a good way to grow up. And since you mentioned the Civil War, what mm -hmm. was what? Which side was your family on in the oh, war? Oh, we were all Confederates. Uh, my, I've had uh, a, my mother's family uh, came from, this is strange, came from Georgia to Texas after the Civil War because things were so bad in Georgia at the time. Uh, her father was a miller, owned a mill, uh, and the other side of the family uh, lived in Carrollton. My great-grandfather was a doctor. Uh, he was in the war. Uh, took care of troops on both sides. Uh, my kin in Texas, my father's people had been in Texas well before the revolution, and when you're in Texas and you say resolution, you, you revolution, sorry, you mean the uh, Texas revolution. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they all, all the men who could, went back south and fought in the war, and, and we were all part of the rebellion. We were rebels. So how was, how did that play out in the politics of the 30s and 40s when you were growing up? What were your family's politics? When I was born, uh, the doctor looked at me and he discovered a Roosevelt button stuck on my butt. <laughs> my family had oh, military, they've been Democrats ever since they came out of the cave, I guess. On all sides of the family, my mother's people, my father's people, I was born, of course, uh, I thought Roosevelt was my father. I loved him. We used to get around the uh, old Philco radio when he'd do his far side chats. I was just a little thing. We had one of the Philcos that stood about that high. And I'd kind of put my chin on it, actually. And everybody would have their chair right as close as they could get to the radio, which seemed strange, but that's what you did. And we'd listen even before I knew what he was saying I was taught to be very quiet very respectful and listen and I grew up literally loving that man and when he died it was just a, like well the family had gone so we were and still are Democrats almost all of us I have four sons three of them are Democrats one of them uh, got seduced by the military-industrial complex. 
<laughs> but he might come. I don't think he'll ever come. He'll ever come back to me on that. I know we. I love him. He's my son, but he's gone to the dark side. But everybody, pretty much everybody, uh, and I have just been active in the party for a long time. So tell me about how you became politically active. What was the first thing you participated in, and how old were you? Uh, okay. <clears throat> I didn't really participate in it, but I think the first thing that got me more interested, when I was going to college at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, Truman came through there on a train, and he stood out on the platform uh, behind the caboose. The train stopped there and made a little speech. and. I'd always been a Democrat and interested in politics, but not so much. But I went down with a friend to hear him speak. And of course, after Roosevelt, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. But I was very impressed. I think the honesty of the man, the integrity. And I began to think more about politics. I didn't really get terribly interested in, or active until uh, Kennedy was running for president. Um, I lived in San Antonio at the time. <clears throat> it was a good democratic time uh, for in the town, a lot of Democrats. And uh, a friend and I uh, got very active. Uh, women were having neighborhood coffees, and uh, you'd invite your friends and serve coffees and cakes. And we'd get some sort of a speaker, a politician, to come and talk. Uh, I helped a time or two organize a time a lot of, um, A man named Maury Maverick owned a huge ranch out of town, had a lot of property out there. And he would have what they called a time a lot of. They would have wash tubs, literally, full of tamales, kegs full of beer. Uh, all kinds of music, all kinds of political speeches. Uh, it was just a great time, a lot of fun, and very uh, up and uh, great people. Uh, so many of the people, of course, in San Antonio are uh, Mexican-American. Most of their families have been there for generations, <clears throat> and uh, they uh, were very active in, in helping with that campaign. And so that's when I really uh, became more active in politics. And then, of course, when Johnson was president, I really loved Lyndon. Uh, growing up in Texas, knew a lot about him, used to see him around Austin zone, and uh, very happy to do some work for him. Uh, did work for, for local Democrats. Uh, I didn't work for Ann Richards when she was running for governor, but I did, because I was not living in Austin then, but I did work for her uh, when she was running for state treasurer. Got to know her, and uh, the more I knew these people, the more I wanted to really get into it. So were you working during these years as well? Uh, <clears throat> I did not work outside the home, or I have, a, I have a steady job. I have four sons. Well, that's a job. And that's a job. I did a lot of volunteer work. Uh, then after they, the last one uh, was pretty much or up, not out of school, but up. Uh, I, I did some work. I, I worked, uh, well, even when the boys were younger, I did a column, a weekly column for the Austin American Statesman on Saturdays. And uh, then I, st I started doing some volunteer work. I, I was a docent at Laguna Gloria, a gorgeous art museum there in Austin. I spent a lot of time there. Also worked in a, a homeless shelter that was in an old church, and a part of it was where they were. We collected clothing and saw to it that it was clean and in good shape, and people would come in if they could afford. To spend any money for something good if they couldn't, if we were given, they were given the clothing. So 
I was always busy doing something and uh, never really worked that much out, outside the house, as I said, till the boys were. I was fortunate. We were not wealthy, but uh, we were comfortable and I was able to do those things. Well, it sounds like you were working. You were doing a lot of I different things. I was doing a lot, yes. Yes. Tell uh -huh. me about your column. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to guess because you never would. Uh, the Austin American Statesman at the time had a column called Time Out, and it came out on Saturdays. And it was arts, entertainment, sports. And I write, I wrote a, column, a sports column. <laughs> and when I tell people that, they just look at me. Uh, I wrote a sports column on, never guess what sport either, sailing. Uh, my husband and I were very much into sailing. We did a lot of uh, racing regattas, uh, just for fun. We owned probably five or six different boats. I loved it. I just loved it. There's a big lake out of Austin, Lake Travis, which actually is part of the Colorado River, dammed up. And uh, I know most people don't believe that, but there's lots of water in Texas, lots of lakes. And we did a lot of offshore racing. That was a great sport. And uh, during that period of time, I was able to meet Walter Cronkite uh, in uh, Freeport, I guess, in the Bahamas. I uh, had a chance to talk to him. And he loved, he loved sailing. He was kind of a sailing junkie. If there was a regatta, he was going to show up. And I was on the dock one day in Freeport. Uh, my husband was going to be crewing for a, well, really a very well-known sailor. And uh, he was about to get on the boat and I was on the dock with him. And he had a ditty bag that was one of my sons and it had the University of Texas logo on it. I saw Walter Cronkite standing on the dock just close to us and I recognized him. But I did. I said, I'm not going to bother him. He's here for, you know, I'm not going to bother him. In a few minutes, he just came strolling over to where we were and said, uh, well, who we went to the university? And, uh, and my husband, Bill, said, oh, it was one of our sons. In fact, our, all of our sons have gone to the university. <clears throat> this one of them at the time, I guess. And uh, so he just started a conversation, how was Austin, what was going on, and so forth. And, Ask about the sailing. <clears throat> then they had was a party that evening, a uh, big cookout and all kinds of stuff. And uh, he was there and came up to us again. And we sat down with him. Uh, he was by himself. And then two or three other times we would run into him at a regatta. Our youngest son was an extremely good sailor. Uh, he was sailing in the J Worlds out of San Francisco, and uh, uh, we ran into him again there. And, and so it's just a lovely man, and just a high spot in my life that I had a chance just to talk to him a little bit and be around him. So when you moved from Texas to Georgia, which happened at some point, did you were you politically active here as well? I, I've been very politically active here, but I didn't move from Texas to Georgia. <laughs> I moved from Texas to Florida, from Florida to Georgia. So, uh, <laughs> tell me about that. Okay. Uh, my husband was killed in an accident. It's been uh, 1980. It's been that long ago. I met someone uh, else. Uh, he had some kin and interest in Florida, and uh, we married, and I moved with him to Florida. And I, I was never really that politically active to start with, with him. Uh, all I will say about that is, uh, it was a mistake of my life to have married him, and uh, the marriage didn't last two years. I like to say I was stupid enough to get into it and smart enough to get out of it. But, <laughs> but the good news is I met Charlie there, 
and uh, we've been together 33 years. Uh, we have never seen fit to marry because, well, we just never really, well, as Charlie says, we're still trying to decide if it's going to work. <laughs> but uh, both of us had our life kind of mapped out one way and another, and, and uh, everything was going well, and we said, well, why are we going to mess up a bad thing? He's a wonderful man. I, as you could see him sitting out there waiting on me. He takes great care of me. Any, anyway, uh, after my second husband left, <laughs> this beginning to sound like a soap opera, uh, and I was with Charlie. I, I did become politically active to a certain degree. I never was as interested in, in, in Florida. I guess I had too many other things going. Uh, we did a, a lot of uh, hiking, camping, boating, and so forth. But after about 12 years, uh, Florida just, I got very tired of Florida. Lovely place, but it's lovely the same all the time. It's beautiful, same beautiful. And uh, we started coming up here to Black Rock uh, in the summer and uh, fell in love with the place, just absolutely fell in love with the area, the whole thing. And uh, one day we decided that we just didn't want to live in Florida anymore. Charlie had been brought up in Missouri, um, close to the Ozarks, and uh, he loved the mountains too. I, I was in business then, I was in the antique business with a friend in Florida. And he managed a, a large crew of building facilities. And we just decided one day that we were not going to stay in there anymore, put the house up for sale. And everybody said to us, you don't want to move to Georgia, it's just hot. And, you know, people think that Georgia is all like South Georgia, most people in other states. And it's not like when you get to the Georgia-Carolina line, the mountains start as soon as you cross the line. They start before, and we had discovered that out. Camping is staying up here because we do a lot of camping. Still, we do. And so we moved up here uh, from Florida. We just one day I said, "Well, we're just going to step out on faith." Sometimes you have to just step out on faith, and it's everything has worked for us. We built a house up here. Uh, he has worked as long as he wanted to, works for himself. Uh, I, I started working here for Carl Butler, down at Butler's, everybody in town knows where that is. Beautiful shop for a long time, uh, till about three years or so ago. Uh, lovely people up here, we've made so many friends. And uh, after we got up here, I really got more interested in, in politics up here in this area. And I've been very active in politics, uh, more on the local or state level than ever before. Always, of course, interested in the presidential elections, but uh, have done, done work for different politicians. Uh, there's a very, for a while our party just almost kind of died, but it's, it's really come back now <laughs> due to someone I won't name, the party has really been energized. Are you talking about the election, the presidential election a last year? Absolutely. So that has made the party in the party Raven was, County rebound? It really has made it rebound. I think uh, not just here, I think in a lot of places. Um, for a while, when I first came up, we, we, were, we were pretty active, quite a few things going on. Um, did some work for different people uh, running for Congress and all that. Nobody was ever elected, but we worked hard <laughs> because this is this is a very red area up here. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that last year, now to my great amazement, you go to our Democratic meetings and uh, there was you know I used to go and there'd be. Yeah, that's six, eight people maybe. Now there will be 30, 35, 40, and we're getting more young people. We're getting more men. And it's, uh, 
it's just great. So uh, I try to get to the meetings and I try to contribute what I can. Uh, the woman's march up here was a great success. Well, uh, tell me about you. Did, did you march here in Clayton? Yes, I got, I'll have to tell you about this. We didn't. We didn't. We, we had a rally, but we didn't march because <clears throat> the some of the people organizing it, and I was included, decided that there were so many of us women who were who were just too old to march. So we just can't see ourselves marching down Main Street with a little pig pussy hat on. We want to do something, so we decided, we were laughing about it. We said, well, we can have a march downtown and our walkers and our canes and our, our little carts and we can all march downtown. <laughs> and we had a big laugh again about it. And then we decided just to have a rally. And the new food bank here, which is the Northeast Georgia Food Bank, has gorgeous facilities. And, and in fact, that's where our party meets at the food bank, they have great meeting room. So we decided to have it a big rally at the food bank. They set up a room for, <coughs> for about 50 people, and they got speakers together. I was one of them, a uh, number of people to speak. Uh, we're talking about local or area speakers, not necessary politicians. Just And uh, when the day came, uh, it was set up for 50 people. When the day came, there were people standing deep around the walls, standing outside. I have never seen such a crowd. It was just fantastic in the energy. And after the designated speakers finished, there were probably five or six of us. Uh, Mary Smith, who is our chairman of the party, Ask, or someone asked if anyone else wanted to say anything. The next thing you know, we had person after person giving up, getting up, standing up, and giving some sort of really wonderful testimony. Uh, we had a black lady who had come all the way from Franklin uh, who spoke inspiringly about the problems that she had run into. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, Mexican American lady who has just lately been naturalized get up and speak about the problems that she and her family have had. Uh, I, I guess I represented the old folks. <laughs> I spoke. We had a, a girl that I think you're going to interview maybe who is 17 I believe and in high school who spoke. Uh, we had men get it. It kind of reminded me of, of an old time religious uh, meeting where the spirit grabs everybody and you've got all these people all the studying standing up and giving this testimony uh, it was it was like that it was just uh, it was wonderful and it was supposed to have been over at I guess let's see it was started at 1230 or 1 and it's supposed to have been over in a couple of hours and it just kept on going we had it was amazing, the crowd, and I was amazed at the young people there. I was amazing at the men. And I think everybody left that rally and I, with a, a new spirit, and, and I think it's it's not just women, you know. There are a lot of men there. Uh, we had uh, one local resident, re older, older guy. I don't know. Uh, I say older. I don't know if anybody's older than me, but he was pretty old. He got up and he said, well, everybody else has spoken, so I'm going to speak. Since somebody has to, has to speak for the, the old, fat, white man. <laughs> it was funny. Tell me about your speech. Well, <clears throat> I gave a speech uh, mainly about two women that I had found very inspiring. Uh, and... Uh, Anne, I, I talked mainly about Ann Richards, but uh, there was another lady uh, who, and I'm having a senior moment here, maybe it will come to me, uh, but the young woman lawyer who was only, I believe, 26, who's, who pled for, for uh, Roe and Roe v. Wade, 
um, maybe her name will come to me or you can get it. Uh, she was out of Austin, Texas, and uh, she was scared to death to go before the Supreme Court. And only went because uh, the lady who was the Roe in Roe v. had come to her earlier for help, and she had tried to help her. And she said, I want you to do this. Now, I understand there was another Roe v. Wade, not Roe v. Wade, but a Roe case in, I think in Georgia with, with another participant at about the same time. But I talked to her a little bit because about her because uh, she had an assistant uh, who happened to be named Anna Richards. And Anna, of course, went on to be governor of Texas. And she had a very interesting history. Um, she had been, uh, she was having a problem with alcohol. Uh, I met her when I, at this time, a partner, I owned, owned a little dress shop in Austin. And Anne came in one day, well before she was governor. I recognized her and she said she needed a dress to wear uh, for a debate. And so I found a dress for her and we talked and she found out I was a Democrat. And she said she was going to run for uh, state treasurer and she needed help and did I, would I be interested in working for her, answering the phone. Of course I would. But what I didn't know was at the time she'd been living with her mother, with her four children. She had just gotten out of rehab for alcoholism. She and her husband had separated just going through some really rough time and she was just trying to pull herself up again by her bootstraps and get it together and of course she did and I had the opportunity to work for her and her, I was just answering the phone uh, but then when she found out that I did a column <clears throat> for the paper albeit not political she asked if maybe I would just not write any speeches I wish I could say I did but I didn't but proofread a few things for her, go over a few things, which was great. It gave me a chance to be around her a little more. So I kind of wrote about her and, and her persistence and, and how strong she was for women and, and everybody. She used to uh, get in her personal car at night when she was governor and go unaccompanied around to nursing homes and go in unannounced just to see what it looked like. And she was appalled by a lot of the things she found, and so she talked to it that that was correct. And of course, she was so witty. She, uh, I quoted a number of things that she said that were very witty. Uh, one thing she said as she'd gotten older was, what do you want on your tombstone? And she said, well, I'll tell you what I don't want. I don't want it to say she kept a very clean house. <laughs> anyway, so we, we talked about some of the things she said. Anyway, that's mainly uh, to her talk and how she'd influenced other people and how she'd come back from a lot of bad things. That was mainly my thrust of what I talked about. So from what you're saying, you were surprised and pleased by the size of the turnout at the rally in Abs Clayton. Absolutely. What other feelings did you have that day? Well, other than just being extremely happy, I joy well, I was surprised. Uh, we expected a good turnout, but we, we was well advertised. And we had people coming from other towns. A busload of people came from Franklin the next day. Um, I guess my feelings were of, hope, I guess. Mm -hmm. I began to feel very hopeful that we could we could actually get together and do what we have to do, which was mainly uh, get some seats, send it in the house. That's what we need to do. So what has been the works that was, the, let me just go back a second. Sure, was back. the rally actually on the same day as the Women's March mm -hmm. in D.C.? So that was your event around the march yes, instead that of a was march. Our event. Mm -hmm. So we, it was January uh, uh, 21st of 2017. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a moment of silence with everybody. We had a, had a screen up to see other places, but as usual, it didn't work. <laughs> Although there were snacks and uh, giving out water and a lot of good food, I mean, just snacks. And were there were there people in wearing the pussy hats? Uh, the, there were a few, women women few who had. There were several women there that I knew who had, had actually marched in Washington. Uh, there were several women wearing them. Yeah. That's so what's sure. been the what have been the what's been the focus of the activities sparked by all that good energy that you felt a year ago? I think the main focus has been in trying to get some Democrats elected to public office here in Georgia and then as as we go longer, you know, and then on the national stage, the mm -hmm. Senate and the House. Um, we're having a Democratic Party meeting um, Monday, Monday night at 5.30 down at the uh, food bank. And Stacy Evans is going to speak. We've been very, uh, very good about, you know, being able to get some people to mm -hmm. come out and, and speak. And we're trying to get more and more of the people running for office to speak or to go in groups to other places to hear them speak. Uh, like I say, it's an awfully red area up here. Mm -hmm. There's and a lot of people, no matter what we do, we're not going to we're not going to get them. But there's just a, a plenty of people and younger people who really have not had much interest in politics mm -hmm. are now beginning to have an interest in politics. Is any of your effort um, aimed at voter registration? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Voter registration. Uh, that is one of our big priorities. Voter registration. Um, and and as we're going to be having, of course, some phone banks, and we will be uh, setting up um, just different places to uh, disseminate information. Um, I worked up here for uh, Clinton and Obama campaigns up here. Uh, so I worked phone banks a lot up here for both of them. Uh, we've had, we even had, uh, even had uh, headquarters a couple of times. I don't know. If this time I expect we'll have headquarters for the national election. Did you have any opposition people? showing up at your rally? No, we didn't. Did that surprise you? I don't think I was surprised about it. I guess because, for one thing, the, where the rally was, we were, for the most part, inside a building. Um, and, you know, you would just have to stand out in the parking lot with a sign, I guess. I don't, as far as I know, we didn't. Um, there was a, a wonderful young man, Tommy, I think it's Tommy Calkins, young reporter who works for the newspaper here. Um, this part probably shouldn't go in there. Um, apparently he's a very good Democrat. He covered our, our rally. And uh, he stayed all afternoon and stood up with all of his equipment and made a lot of pictures and uh, put a big article in the paper on the front page of the living section with pictures and lots of stuff. And I knew, I knew he was a Democrat because I was watching him when he was filming and someone would say a certain thing, he would go. <laughs> But I leave that part out about him. It might get him in trouble with this job. But it was really neat. He's a super nice guy. So you've got the, we have allies here and there, you know, <laughs> in the sea of, of red. Uh, I live uh, in a, a an association uh, about four and a half miles from town, up on the side of a mountain. And uh, almost all of my neighbors, not everybody, but almost, have come here from somewhere else. And 
for when I first moved up there, everybody just about was a Republican, but Charlie and I. Um, and now, it's, it's even out more. Uh, there's probably about as many, and there's not a lot of people up there. But so, 16, 8, 10 couples, maybe, maybe a little more. But we've had a few more new people move in. Uh, a couple that uh, had their property destroyed, the Virgin Islands had moved in, the Democrats. A couple of two, two different uh, groups of women who were partners, great, great ladies, all of them good Democrats. Uh, anyway, it's getting to be more of a mixed bag up there. So it sounds like you feel more hopeful than I you do. did around the time of the election. I do. I, I there for a while, I'll tell you what, I went to bed before the results of that election and I, I was a big, big Hillary supporter. Uh, part of it selfish, I just wanted to see a woman be a president before I die. And how many more years do I got, you know, I, I really wanted and I thought there's not a more qualified person in the world than Hillary Clinton for this job. I was just sure she was going to get it. I just really hadn't taken Trump that seriously. And uh, I went to bed before it was over and uh, you know, I was sure I'd wake up in the morning. Got up the next morning and Charlie was sitting in the, in the living room very quietly. The TV wasn't on. And, you know, I would think if, you know, if Hillary won it, the TV would be on and it, it was quiet as a mouse. And I walked in and I said something about, all right, you know, let's drink some coffee to our new woman president. And Charlie looked at me and he said, Jane, he said, she didn't make it, it's Trump. I thought he was teasing, I really thought he was teasing me. I just couldn't believe it. I just, I mean, I think, I think I started to scream and cry all at the same time. I was, I think if a family member had died, I couldn't have been more upset there for a few minutes. I just didn't believe it. I just, I didn't believe it, you know. And I was just so angry and it was terrible. I'm I, getting tears now thinking about it. And it seemed like at the time there was just nothing anybody could do. But as time has gone on, I figured, yes, there is. I've had friends who said, well, I'm just not going to listen to the news. Or look, or I don't, it's just so bad, I'm just going to, I can't do anything about it. But you know, I think I can. I think, I think we can. I think we can do something about it. That's, we've got to stay up on it. We've got to watch, see what's going on, bad as it is, grip my teeth, oh, look at it. But there's something we can do. But it's got to be done in numbers, and uh, that's what we've got to get done, is to get enough people. Uh, Clinton, Georgia is never going to be a democratic area. I, I just don't believe it ever will be. But um, we're just a part of it, a little bitty part of it. I believe if we get uh, if we can get more Mexican-American people, Cuban-American people, black people to, to go to the polls and vote, I even believe that Texas will be a blue state one of these days. Uh, I would love to see, I, I would love to see a Mexican-American run for maybe vice president. I love the Castro brothers. Uh, Julian, I believe, is mayor of San Antonio. They're twins. I don't know if you're familiar with them. The other one is in the Senate. Uh, they are really good. I watched Joe Kennedy's speech. I think he's going to be good. I don't think he's ready, but he will be one day. You mean that after the State of the Union? Yeah, the rebuttal. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch the State of the Union. Like I said, I decided that I would join the group, not to watch, just so his numbers wouldn't be any higher. <laughs> and I 
seriously, I just didn't think I could do it anyway. I just didn't think I could. <laughs> There's a limit. Are there any uh, women that you think could make a viable candidate for the presidency in the next election so that... I don't know really. I, you know, I've got some people I love, but they're all too old. I love Joe Biden. I'd love to see Hillary run again, which I know she wouldn't anyway. I'm not that crazy about Bernie Sanders. Uh, but all these people, apart from the way I feel about them, they're too old. We need somebody young in there. And I, I think that we're probably going to have to have for president a man. Um, I do, there's just a number of women that I like a lot, but I can't, I have not really settled on any one woman that, that I think could, could do it. Uh, like I say, I think next time around, we're probably going to have to get a good man in there. Um, I'm not sure. I just don't know. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if Trump's going to be in there eight years or not. And if he's not, then we might have pants, and that's kind of worse. Uh, he might not put his finger on the nuclear button argue about his button was the biggest, but he is bad. <laughs> He's bad news, very bad. He's saner, which might be worse. So, there we are. So, did you have any kind of uh, rally or special meeting this year as on the anniversary of your last rally or did, here in Clayton? Uh, no, we didn't. I guess because you know, last year we didn't. There was we didn't have a rally last year. I mean, well, this. Well, this, yeah, it was. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was last year. I'm sorry. Yes. The anniversary just passed. Yes. I, I, yes. I'm sorry. I don't know if you had something special to mark the anniversary or to get everybody back together again. I think it'd be a great idea. But it sounds like you've kept having regular meetings, and that's been yeah, your follow-up, which is. Organizing for yeah, projects and yeah, we're meeting uh, well once a month at the food bank, but then we've got different committees uh, getting going on for like you say voter registration. Um, we had uh, the meeting before this one. The lady, the woman here who is in charge of the elections, uh, I can't think of the the, to the title exactly. Um, she's in charge of, of all the, the elections here in Clayton. Um, Tammy Whitmire is her name. Uh, but she came in to talk to us about uh, the voting machines here, how they were secured, uh, how people could register to vote uh, if they were out of town, uh, how people could vote early vote, just all the information you might need. I guess she's elections, well, I'm sorry, I can't, can't put my, thumb, my finger on exactly what the title is, but uh, she is in charge of overseeing. Very knowledgeable, very smart lady. Uh, and uh, she gave everybody a lot of good information. Um, so you're doing continuing like education efforts and mm -hmm. outreach efforts, and that's Absolutely. been was energized actually by the election, the presidential election. Absolutely, and I think that's true. Not not just here. I think it. I think everybody suddenly waked up. It's terrible to say that we just kind of going, well, you know. Well, I, I I did work for Hillary. I mean, I I did some calling and various things you do wanted her to win so badly, but then I just got complacent because I just thought it was just in the bag. She was just going to, it's just going to happen. I mean, come on, you know. And, and it didn't, and I think that was a big wake-up call, like, well, when we let ourselves down a little bit, when we don't do our, our work, we do look into things. Uh, this kind of thing can happen, and it's 
it's amazing that it could happen. I'm still stunned, honestly, part of me is to believe that this country could do this. I'm stunned at people I know who are intelligent, well-educated, who voted for that man, and uh, who want to argue politics with you, um, tell you how great it is. I think some of them may have kind of waked up because they don't want to talk about it anymore. And uh, we have some good friends that we just don't talk politics with because they're not going to convince us. We're not going to convince them. Um, so we just still friends. But uh, I have, I don't say anything. But if someone says some bad things about one of my candidates or uh, someone in office, I will talk back. I, I even unfriended one of my sons for a while. <laughs> You mean on Facebook? Yeah. The one who was uh, the uh, Republican leading son. When Obama was running for president, he, he uh, I don't mind criticism. If, uh, he could say, I don't like Obama because I don't like his policies or whatever. But no, he, uh, he said something racial. And I sent him a, uh, something back uh, on Facebook. And I, no, I called him. And I said, look, I don't appreciate that, and I don't want to see you do that again. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry, Mom, I'm sorry, I won't. Uh, two or three weeks later, something else popped up. So I just went over there and hit the button. <laughs> and after a while, he uh, acknowledged the fact that he had overstepped his bounds and we're friends. And he doesn't, he doesn't. He doesn't say anything about politics at all. <laughs> You're still his mother. Yeah. Still can still can bring up the standards if you want to impose them. Absolutely, you know. I'm still mother. That's and, right. Uh, they can be different. It's their right, but uh, there are certain boundaries you just don't cross. So before we, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to say it. We have a couple of really close friends who are Republicans. And when Hillary was running for president one day, the wife said something about Hillary that was unacceptable. And uh, I just told her, I said, well, you know, we're Democrats. And I said, the only way we're ever going to really keep this friendship going is just not talk about politics. I would appreciate it if we don't. We don't. And she didn't do it. Reason. That seems like the thing that we have to do nowadays if we're going to be able to be sociable and, and across party lines. It's sad. It's sad. I can remember a time when there really wasn't that much difference in the Democrats and the Republicans. When I was growing up, nobody really cared. It didn't really matter that much. It just didn't, you know. Uh, you didn't even necessarily know if somebody was a Democrat or a Republican when I was a kid. You just didn't. When I was growing up in that little town in Texas, it was very, it was, uh, it was very, very blue. Uh, all Democrats, just about all Democrats. Can you please spell the name of your hometown? I didn't quite catch yeah. it. It's R O T A N. Rotan. 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 Yeah. Um, I had an uncle who was postmaster there for many years, and one time I heard my mom and dad when I was about five or six talking about the job of being the postmaster, and they said they were worried that Roosevelt wasn't going to win the next election. And my mother said, well, if, if he doesn't, won't you, Uncle Jack might be out of a job. Uh, he might not be postmaster. They'll, they'll appoint a Republican. I don't know if they ever did that, really. I thought they did. The pres it was a, well, it's that kind of job. And, and I remember I worried about that. I couldn't have been more than six. Or so. I worried myself to death. I didn't even know what a Republican was. Now, that's how Democratic that town was. And I went downtown with my mother one day. She was shopping in a little shop. And I remembered that my dad said, well, I don't think there are any Republicans in town anyway. And 
Mother said, I think Mr. McNair might be a Republican. So we went downtown and Mr. McNair and had a hardware store downtown, about two doors down from where Mother was shopping. And I slipped away from her and she found me looking in the window like this at the hardware store trying to see a Republican. Now that's how few Republicans we had. And I told her that, you know, I was worried that he was going to take my uncle's job and I wanted to see him. And so she took me in the store. She said, now, I'm not even sure that Mr. McNair is a Republican, but it doesn't matter. I want you to come in here. And she made me meet Mr. McNair and shake hands with Mr. McNair. And he gave me a lollipop. <laughs> and I thought, well, Republicans don't really have horns and tails, I guess. You know? <laughs> but that's just how few Republicans we had at the time. And Lyndon Johnson, God bless him, when he did what he did for civil rights, he said, well, I've lost the South for the Democrats for generations. And, and he's right, except that he did the right thing. So we're now going to have to get it back, not just the South, but the country. That's a fantastic slogan and a great way to, to, to end the interview. I had one more question for you. To, yes. To, thinking back on everything you've said and the wonderful stories you've told and the perspective that you have that's, uh, for me at least, unique in the interviews that I've done. I've not interviewed anyone in your uh, generation. So you have this long view of it and that's really valuable. Is there anything we haven't covered about this subject that, that you want to talk about for a moment before we end? We have certainly uh, covered the waterfront. Uh, you know, maybe the, I, I have the perspective of looking back on all the presidents since FDR and uh, some good, some bad, some indifferent. I don't, I can't really think of anything that any notes we haven't hit. I, I just basically, again, want to stress the point that uh, it's going to take everybody to get in there and get this done, and we have to get some Democrats, women and men, in the Senate, in the House, local levels. And even though you know that the person you're working for, as in Raven County, is not going to get elected, just trying, you're going to get a lot of interest, you're going to get a lot of people together, and you're going to maybe get, get, get close. Uh, and then we'll get closer and closer. And I, I regret the fact that I may not live to see all of this happen, but I am going to try to see some of it happen. Thank you. You're welcome.